So my name is David Stone. I'm here to talk to you about type deduction in C++11 and C++14. Now, the presentation that I'm about to give you is a very different presentation than I thought it was going to be when I first started preparing for it. I was thinking that everything I was going to talk about was going to be auto, decal type, template parameters, uh, maybe a few meta functions, and there is going to be a lot of that in here. But I realized as I was preparing this that type deduction means something very different than I thought it meant, and what a lot of us probably think that it means. And that to really understand type deduction, you have to understand a few other things that we've kind of taken for granted, a few things that we think we knew, but they actually mean something else. So type deduction has existed um, since C, actually. Um, Uh, it's been expanded with every version of the language. Uh, the goal is generally to remove redundancy and improve safety. Uh, secondary goal is efficiency. Now when I say that type deduction has existed since C, consider this expression. We have some function f, some function g, and some function h. We don't say what they return, but we know that the return type of f and g can be added together to produce some value, some temporary value. And then whatever type that is, it can be added to H. Now in C, there was no operator overloading, no function overloading. So this was limited to returning built-in types, ints, doubles, that sort of thing. But the compiler would generate the correct double add instruction or int add instruction for this. Now C++ adds in a few other things to the mix, such as converting or non-explicit constructors, implicit conversion operators, and overloaded functions. And the three of those combined actually create a, fairy a fairly powerful um, type deduction sort of system. When I call f of x, what that really means is look for the function f, consider everything that x has an implicit conversion operator to, consider everything that any arguments of f that we find can be implicitly constructed from an x, and find the best match from all of that combined. Now, C++ also has template parameters, auto and decal type. That's presumably what most of you are, are here to learn some more about, and I'll be spending a lot of time talking about that as well. Now, in addition to type deduction, we have type computation. This is meta functions like standard common type. Um, any way where you can take types and compute a new type from them. Now, C++ is a statically typed language. And I think if you're using it right, it's a strongly typed language. Now we, everything has a type in C++. Our values have types, expressions have types, functions have types. And in fact, even our types have types. It's called the value category. It's the type of our types. So there are some value categories that are fairly easy to understand and some that are maybe a little bit more confusing, a little bit more fuzzy. So easiest is the PR value, the pure R value. This was a refinement of the R value category added in, uh, added in uh, C++ 11. So originally we just had R values and L values and that was fine. And the PR value is what we originally called just an R value. This is when we construct a temporary or we return by value. It just says, say, standard string as the return type. And we have L values. This is when we say standard string ref, or standard string const ref. If we reference a named variable, or we, re we return by an L value reference, we have an L value. And then there's this other value category, called an X value, an expiring value. When we say standard string ref ref, that usually means it's an X value, but only if you're returning it from a function. It can also be an L value if you have a named variable, for instance, a function parameter that you declare as ref ref. Suddenly, it's no longer an X value, it's an L value, and we have to move from it to make it an X value again. So now that we kind of have that value category basics, we can move on a little bit to what auto means. So one of the common mistakes that 
I see people make when they use auto is they think it means do what I mean. Uh, really it means x is by value. If blah returns a reference, you're going to make a copy there. If it returns by value, you're going to make a move. X is never a reference. Now it can be a pointer or a reference wrapper. Those are taken by value. When we say reference, we specifically mean something with the ampersand there. Auto ref ref, X is always a reference, as opposed to auto, where it was just always a value. It's always a reference. Const is deduced. It accepts anything. So if blah returns by value, then X, the type of X, is going to be, say, something ref ref. It'll always be a reference. So when I say that const is deduced, blah can return int const ref, and that's fine. The type of auto will be int const ref, and that'll be the type of X. Now we can refine this a little bit. Instead of using auto ref ref, we can just say auto ref. And that restricts what X can be slightly. It means almost the same thing as the previous, except it will not bind to any sort of temporary. If blah returns an R value reference or by value, this won't work. You know that what you have is a reference that wasn't a temporary. And finally, we can say auto const ref. Conceptually, what this means is I'm just going to look at the value. I don't care if it was a temporary. I don't care if it exists somewhere else and it's going to persist. This also accepts anything because it can bind to a temporary, just like the regular reference to const that we're used to, and it extends the lifetime. So as long as that x is alive, that temporary that it binds to is alive. And then there's some, yes? I just They seem very similar. Yes. Okay, so the difference between this and auto ref ref, when you would use one versus the other, what this says is I'm just going to read from the value, whereas what auto ref ref says is whatever type you return, I'm going to <coughs> maintain that value category. And if I want to move from the value, I can. You cannot move from x here. Whereas if I say auto ref ref, I can then move from that value if it did happen to be an R value. Yes? How does that differ from decal type auto? So decal type auto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, the, the question was how does that differ from decal type auto? Um, decal type auto is a reference if blah returns by reference, and it's a value if blah returns by value. Essentially, the value category is completely deduced. Whereas auto ref ref said if you return an R value reference or you return a PR value, I don't care. I'm going to treat them the same. Decal type auto says, I'm going to maintain the distinction between value and <coughs> reference. Um, so to summarize this, we have auto type deduction by value. Auto ref ref, const ref, or ref are all type deduction by reference. Uh, this is the same as template arguments. We're used to our template arguments. We have a function template. If we say template type name t, and our function parameter just says t without a reference, that means by value. If we say t ref, t ref ref, or t const ref, that means a reference. It's the same as auto. Um, decal type auto is type deduction plus reference deduction, except not quite. That bullet point is actually a lie, but it's a useful <coughs> lie. So later on in the slide, I'm going to tell you exactly where this does break down. But for the most part, it can be useful to think of it this way. Now, I mentioned earlier that one of the main goals of type deduction is reducing redundancy from our programs. For instance, consider this expression. We reinterpret cast some address into a char const star, and then we store it into a char const star. We are repeating that type in there twice. We specify it once on the right-hand side to generate the expression, and then once on the left-hand side to generate the variable. Or consider a function make vector. In the return type of the function, we say standard vector of int. And in the body of the function, we say standard vector of int. We know by looking at either one of these what the other one must mean. But prior to C14, we were forced to specify them in both locations. Now we can just say auto make vector. Or instead of specifying standard vector event here, we can use curly braces. Typically, um, what I've seen is the auto return type, because then we have 
the full expression there and it works with implicit or explicit constructors. Um, more examples of redundancy in the language. Consider malloc. We call malloc, we have to specify the size of the variable that we're trying to allocate space for, and then we specify the type that we're going to store the pointer to that data in. This is the C version. Now, I have seen a lot of code that looks like this. Works on Windows. Long is 32-bit. Size of long is 4. <coughs> and you can have an int pointer. Works just fine. Till you port to Linux, where long on a 64-bit system is 64 bits instead of 32 bits. Now you start having issues. The problem here was the redundancy. Now in C++, we can do this sort of thing. Even more redundancy in there. Or we can use new. The goal of new, one of the goals anyway, was to reduce this extra um, needing to specify the type unnecessarily. Uh, so this is a little bit better. Now, better than that is this. Now, rather than having, you know, int pointer mean it might refer to something, it might own something, we have just the one type for it. But going more into detail that, I guess, would be more for another presentation. But this would be the C++14 way to have a uh, allocate memory to something. So the, the general idea here is the principle of don't repeat yourself, or dry. Good type deduction lets you say what you mean exactly once. If you say it twice, then you have to change it twice when it changes, and there's a chance that you'll get it wrong. With type deduction, we can build powerful, reusable abstractions. So with powerful abstractions, if one feature can do everything another feature can, plus more, then that weaker feature is useless. <coughs> Why have two ways of doing the same thing? How many people would agree with this statement? Okay. Some, some people not so sure, some people yes, some people no. I'm thinking that's, that is the entire mission statement of Perl right there. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's one way to do it. <laughs> No, there's more than one way to do it. Okay, so let's consider this, though. What would that actually mean if we do believe in this? Let's consider casts. We have a C-style cast, which can be static cast, const cast, reinterpret cast, plus a little bit extra. Could ignore some access specifiers. Basically, C-style casts can do everything that these casts can and more. It's a more powerful feature. And yet we still have and want the C++ casts. And the reason is safety. If we can use a more powerful feature that can do more than we need, then it might do more than we want. It might do more than we expect. Whereas if we use the more limited feature that does exactly what we mean and no more, we know <coughs> that that's the only thing that's going on. So push back and in place back have I guess a colorful history since C++11. Um, I have read a lot of advice when C++11 first came out of prefer emplacement to insertion, prefer emplace back to pushback. And recently people have started to question that advice. Um, now the general idea is that pushback will copy or move your object and emplace back constructs the objects in place. This is the traditional definition of what these two functions mean. In place back accepts any number of arguments and forwards. So with push back, you'd have to make a call like this, and in place back looks more like this. Now I'd actually argue that this understanding of push back and in place back is incomplete. Um, and in fact, some people also view that one of the goals of in place back is to reduce that redundancy, to have type deduction in play, where with in place back, we just specify the constructor arguments and the type is implicit from the type of the vector. With pushback, we have to specify that type again. If we declared the variable right here, that looks like an unnecessary redundancy. Now, we can also use this syntax with pushback. Essentially the same as in placeback. Pushback is capable of, of the same level of type deduction that in placeback is here, as long as this constructor argument is not <coughs> explicit. Now, 
I think, though, the real difference comes into play when there's only one argument to the function. We think of pushback as copy or move and in place back as construct in place. But when there's one argument, I think the real difference is that pushback will only call implicit constructors and in place back will call explicit constructors. In place back is the more powerful feature. Almost anything that pushback can do, in place back can do as well. Um, however, I still think that when you have one argument, and you do not intend to do an explicit conversion, you want to improve your safety, I would recommend using pushback. Because it can only call implicit constructors, and implicit constructors are supposed to be safe. They're supposed to be, this type is substitutable for that type. It can convert to that type with no loss of information. Yes? Um, can you switch back? So why, why is this difference only the case for one argument? So why don't we have this difference also for multiple arguments? Because explicit matters for multiple arguments with initial arguments. Yes, so the question was, why is this different for one argument versus multiple arguments? Because it is actually possible to declare a multi-argument constructor explicit. And if you do so, then... Oops. Let me get there. If you do so, then the second syntax won't work because vector can only call implicit constructors. Now, the reason that I say that it's different for one argument versus two arguments or more arguments is that this is very difficult to do accidentally. <coughs> With a single argument, it's easy to do accidentally. You might think that the type I'm doing is the same. Whereas that extra syntax of having to put the braces is your way of saying, I want to construct this. So in general, I would actually typically argue against explicit multi-argument constructors because the only way you can invoke them is intentionally. Now, when I talk about type deduction and using auto variables, when anybody talks about it really, um, well, I, actually, let, let me back up a second. So, with the uh, to give you a real world example of how pushback and in place back have um, caused problems, I guess, in uh, a code base that I worked on, I was converting some code from C oh three to C eleven, and at the time I was thinking, oh yeah, let's switch everything to in place back, we'll get better efficiency, everything will be good. And, you know, let's get rid of all the new and deletes and use a unique pointer and everything will be good. So this used to be a vector that had just, say, an int star or some sort of class pointer. But it owned memory, so I changed it to unique pointer. Now before I had made that change, I had gone and replaced a whole bunch of pushbacks with in place back. And somewhere in our code, someone had done something like this. And this compiles. They passed in a pointer to a non-heap allocated variable, compiled just fine because there is an explicit constructor from unique pointer that accepts just a regular raw pointer. If we had left the code as pushback, the compiler would have caught the problem as soon as we switched to unique pointer. But by switching to in place back, calling the explicit constructor instead of the implicit constructor, we did not get the error message, and it wasn't until much later that we actually found the bug. Um, it was a long-standing bug, it had always existed. In place back didn't cause this particular bug to happen, but it prevented us from catching it sooner than we could have. Um, so now, when, whenever people talk about using auto variables, um, the concern is that we will lose useful type information. Um, so, you know, we have some function, return some value, and we want to store it here. And so we have this useful type information right there. We have the documentation of what some function returns. And if we switch to this, we lose that. Or let's say we have some function, and it returns a, a vector of customers. And we get rid of the type, we change it to auto, it's just going to be auto v. Now, what I've found is common in those examples is that 
these are horrible variable names and horrible function names. Like, you don't want to just have some function and x and v and stuff. This is pretty readable, I think. We know that customers is some container of some sort of customer object. If that's all that we need to know about it, this is just fine. Or how about this function? By having useful variable names like thrust and the function calculate thrust, then using auto instead of double doesn't really lose you all that much. And in fact, it allows you to easily change the type that thrust returns and have your code still compile and be correct. The real question comes down to what does type deduction really mean? What does declaring the type of a local variable mean versus just what we want it to mean and what we think it means? For instance, consider this function here. We have a function calculate horizontal bias, returns an int 16t, and we store that value into the variable bh. Except if you're working on the Ariane 5, what this really means is calculate the horizontal bias, do an implicit cast to assign 16-bit integer, and store that variable in bh, causing the rocket to crash 37 seconds after launch because it was actually returning a 64-bit floating point value. Whereas a syntax more like this means whatever type calculate horizontal bias returns, that is the type of bh. We think of specifying the types of our variables as providing useful documentation, but sometimes it's like a comment that specifies what your code does, and it can get out of sync with what your code actually does. It can mislead people rather than help. It can make the situation murkier rather than clearer. Um, so, excuse me. Yes. I'm curious, aren't you just delaying the problem there? Because you're, you're saying that, that we're doing this cast, but in most systems, would it not give you a warning that you're taking a, a double going to an end? And even if it didn't, does the problem just get pushed forward until you actually misuse it? So the question was, um, First, in most systems, there's a warning for conversion from double to int. And second, aren't we just moving the problem somewhere else? Instead of the cast happening right here, it's going to happen at some point in our calculation. Um, and so my answer to that is not necessarily, um, especially if we make use of more type deduction to forward the types through the system rather than committing to a specific type. The general idea is, <coughs> a long-standing idea that object-oriented programmers champion and generic programmers also do as well. The idea is program to an interface rather than an implementation. Now in a static type, type deduction sort of system, what that means is that yeah, you would use auto variables and the calculations would occur in the native type rather than casting everything to one common type that we do our calculations in. Um, if we do actually do need to specify a particular type, say we're interfacing with some other library that just has a function that accepts in 16t, for instance, we don't have a choice there. Or maybe our goal is to reduce compile time dependencies. We don't want to have a template function that's in the header and brings in, you know, 50 other headers that are all implementation details. Then what we should do here is rather than relying on this implicit cast, if we expect calculate horizontal bias to actually be returning an int 16t, then we have a perfectly good tool for that in C++11, the static assert. Use the type deduction and then do a static assert that the type is the type that you expect. If you actually intend for a conversion from double to int 16t, the built-in conversion operator probably isn't what you want because if there's an overflow, it's undefined behavior you probably want to have some sort of check in there. And in the rare case that you don't, I would argue that because people have this view of what this first statement means versus what it actually means, you are better off using something more like the second syntax. Um, it's the same sort of idea that Herb Sutter has, um, has proposed um, with your first words, almost always auto, the AAA syntax where you use type deduction and when you actually do mean to do a conversion, when you actually do mean a cast, you make it explicit. 
you say static cast or some sort of checked float to int cast or something that makes your intent obvious. When you see the first line, you don't know what the programmer meant. Did calculate horizontal bias used to return an int 16t and now it returns a double? Are they expecting it to be a conversion? Did they just get the type wrong? What does it mean? It's hard to say. With the explicit cast, it's explicit. So return type deduction was added in C++14. It was in C++11 for <coughs> lambdas only. And then in C++14 it was added, expanded to any type of function can have return type deduction. As long as the body is visible before its first use. So the first line returns an int by value. The second line returns an int by value because decal type of five is int. The third line returns an angling reference. Five is a PR value. We try to return an R value reference to it. It's the same as returning a reference to any other sort of temporary variable. Not allowed. One thing you do have to be careful of. You can't just say, auto ref ref everywhere and have it figure it out. The lifetime problem is still alive and well in C++. So let's say we have this function here, auto a, returns this string literal. By a show of hands, how many people think this function returns char const star? Anybody? Okay. How about the second line, char const reference to an array of size two? And how many people think something else entirely? Okay. Turns the first one, pointer to a char const. The reason is arrays cannot be passed by value and string literals are just arrays. So decay occurs just like at any other return statement or passing something by value to a function. So it decays to a pointer to the first element. If we use auto ref ref, on the other hand, we're passing a reference. And this is the same as passing a reference to a function. You can pass arrays by reference to functions, and so we end up with a type being a reference to an array of size two. Now it's size two because that string literal b also has the null terminator at the end. How about decal type auto? Anybody want to venture a guess at what the return type of this function actually is? So decal type auto returns the type exactly as declared. A string literal, its actual type is a reference to an array of size 2, and so that is the type that is returned. But strings are pretty tricky. <coughs> when you switch to using the almost always auto style, strings have a unique pitfall related to the previous slides. We had this code in our code base recently. Originally, hi was of type standard string, and someone went through and changed it to auto. Now, what happened here is that when we construct this struct, we have the string literal hi, char const star. We construct a temporary standard string that we bind to in the constructor, and then we store that reference. We try to use it. it seemed to work. It passed all the unit tests because the memory just happened to not be reused. But it's undefined behavior. And when we ran it in a production, it suddenly stopped working because the values suddenly happened at just the right time to overwrite memory. So how do we fix this? When we have a problem like this, I don't like to just say, okay, we'll just change that back to standard string and call it good. That fixes this problem, but it doesn't fix the general problem. And the general problem here is that a reference <coughs> to const can bind to a temporary. And if you're storing that reference, the temporary can expire because there is no lifetime extension here. The lifetime extension occurs just for this statement here. Once we store it somewhere else, gone. So what do we do to stop it? And the problem would have occurred same here. We can explicitly delete that overload. So this says, if we're passing an R value reference to a string, if we're passing a temporary standard string, delete it. Compile error. That's a better overload resolution than a reference to const for a temporary. However, what happens if we try to do this with a template? We have something like this. 
that ref ref doesn't mean our value reference. It means a universal reference or a forwarding reference. It means it's a reference to something, just like with auto ref ref. T ref ref s, the type of s could be R value reference or an L value reference. We only want L value references. So what do we do to stop this? There's a few options. We have enable if, <coughs> and we have static assert. In general, I would go with static assert. You get much better error messages than with enable if. Enable if is for allowing you to select between multiple overloads. Here, we say one version is an error, one version is not. So make it an error. The header type traits has some useful utilities in it. In this case, we want standard is L value reference. Now, there is a pitfall here as well, unfortunately. <coughs> if we pass an R value, let's say we wanted to make this condition instead not standard is R value reference. We have two options. We could put T ref ref or just T. <coughs> if we put stand, not standard is R value reference, T, the type of T is not an R value reference. If we pass a standard string to this, T is standard string, and then we have the ref ref spelled out there. So T there is actually a PR value. It's not a reference at all. So when you're dealing with templates and you have reference parameters, the tricky thing here is trying to make sure you understand what type is T versus the decal type of S. The decal type of S is T ref ref. And I'll get into exactly how you can find out what T really is a little later in the presentation. But first I want to talk a little bit about member functions. Let's say we have this struct. It contains a string by value. And we have this member function in it. Auto return type returns a standard string. Anybody want to venture a guess at what the return type of this function is? Not a trick? STD string, STD string exactly. <coughs> and auto ref ref, anybody venture a guess at what this type is? Yeah. String ref, yeah, exactly. Just an L value reference to a string, because this ref ref here is universal reference or forwarding reference. It's not R value reference. Let's say we add reference qualifiers to the mix. We have the same struct, and we say, OK, let's, uh, let's try to do some perfect forwarding here. Let's you know, deduce everything we can about this. So we have an S that's a, a const ref, and we return M. Returns a standard string. Standard string, standard string. The reason is, what decal type really does is it looks at the type exactly as declared. The type of M, as declared, is standard string. It doesn't matter how we're accessing it. All it looks at is, where was the type of this variable declared? What was the exact type? That's the type I'm going to give you. So we need some way to turn a variable into an expression. The answer is, put parentheses around it. Now, fortunately, you almost never need this. Most of the time that you use this, this is not actually what you mean, and I'll show you what you do mean in just a second. But in the few cases that you do need it, the extra set of parentheses means, okay, I'm not giving you the decal type of M. I'm giving you the decal type of this expression, which in the case of just a local variable is going to be an L value reference. Or, if f returns a reference to const to s, its member variable is a reference to const. An r value reference returns an r value reference string. And if we return s by value, we just get a standard string by value. This is where we get that reference deduction that I was talking about earlier. Now fortunately, auto ref ref is a little bit simpler. Unfortunately, it is not simple. We say auto ref ref with a reference qualified 
const ref on there, we get a standard string const ref, just what we'd expect. If we say just a single reference qualifier on there, not const, standard string ref, just like we'd expect. But now if we have an R value reference qualifier, and this really does mean R value reference qualifier on here. So only operate on a R value standard string. The return type is standard string ref. <coughs> and the reason is the committee was very cautious when they added R value references and moved semantics. They did not want to risk breaking anybody's code by accident. So the first function will move s. It will say, OK, I took a standard string by value, and I'm returning a standard string by value. I know nobody out there has a reference to s, so it's safe to move it. The second, arg the second function will make a copy of s. And the reason is someone somewhere might still have a reference to s. They'd have to call standard move to do this, but they might still have a reference to s, and we don't really want, we want to make sure that things are safe. So you get a move at the top and a copy in the bottom. Or consider this function. The top version compiles, the second version doesn't, because there is no copy constructor for unique pointer, and the second function is trying to copy it. So the correct way to write that member function with the R value reference qualifier, you have to explicitly say standard move. Now, I would consider this a defect in the standard, that we treat R value reference parameters as something that someone might still have, even though the only way you could get here is if someone called standard move and then called the member function. Someone explicitly said, I want to move, but we're not going to. If you have an R value reference as a function parameter and you pass it into another function, it does the right thing. It says, oh, okay, um, you can use it later on in that function. So it actually passes it in as an L value reference. That's what I was talking about earlier. How when you see standard string ref ref, that might mean X value and it might mean L value. If you return it from a function, for instance, by calling standard move, it's an x value, you're saying it's safe to move from. If you just have a local variable, you're saying it's safe to move from at some point, but you're not necessarily saying that every use of it should be a move. So this is a not yet. Okay. I will. Okay. Um, so what's that? Okay. Okay. Oh, then the question was, did I submit a defect? And my answer was, I will. Yes. So the question was, do I really need this ref ref here? Yeah. Um, that is a bit trickier of a question than you might think. Um, so if you say auto ref ref here, the type is deduced to standard string ref ref. It's an X value. If you just say auto, you leave off the double ampersand, then it's a PR value that you return. For standard string, it probably doesn't really make a difference. For something like, say, standard array int 5000, um, if you say auto ref ref, then you're returning an R value reference to the array. If you say auto, you're returning a, you're moving the array, which is the same as copying the array. And you will get this behavior every time that you call this function on a temporary s. It could just be that I really just want to look at the result of this. I'm not actually trying to take ownership of it, but s happened to be temporary. You don't want to assume that moves are always cheap. In cases of arrays or very large class types, they can be expensive too. And so in this case, I would put the auto ref ref there because someone might just be looking at it. It's not 
something that is being created new. Like if I were returning something that didn't already exist, you have to return by value or you have a dangling reference. In this case, that standard string right there is where the real value is. If someone takes ownership of it, the move will occur. If no one takes ownership of it, then we don't have a move, we just have a reference. So yes. Does that mean if you don't put the reference, the deduce type will be just std string instead of std string ref ref? Yes. The question was if I don't put the ref ref, the deduce type will be standard string, and the answer is yes, which means that this value will always be moved from. So let's say we want to forward a function parameter. We, uh, we have this function. Um, pretend like I named that function instead of variable. Don't know how that happened. And we have these two functions here. These two functions mean the exact same thing. They're different ways of writing the same code. The reason is standard forward is going to forward x as an r-value reference, if it's an r-value reference. It's going to forward x as an l-value reference, if it's an l-value reference. You're not going to have a value here. These two functions are the same thing. I would recommend writing it the second way. Because auto ref ref means I am always returning a reference, and that is what this function always does. If you have a member variable, these two functions mean the exact same thing. The top version, we had to parenthesize to turn that from a variable into an expression. The bottom function, we just say standard forward. The top version, someone might look at that and see, return isn't a function, why are you putting parentheses around it? Get rid of them and now your code means something else. Bottom version, much more obvious. They mean the exact same thing. I'd recommend saying auto ref ref when you mean this is always a reference. So really, some people might be wondering right now, well then when do I use decal type auto? Like, so far you've always said use auto ref ref instead. Let's say we're calling a member function instead of a accessing a member variable. Decal type auto means return exactly what member returns. If we said auto ref ref and member returned by value, we'd have a dangling reference. Decal type auto is for forwarding the result of a function call when you use it as a return statement, or as the return type, rather. So let's say we have this struct, s. Has a default constructor, has this constructor template, and we have these two declarations. Question is, what does this code print? And I think this is an interesting question, because someone who's fairly new to C++ would probably get this right. And somebody who is a bit more advanced has a pretty good chance of getting it wrong. So let me give you a hint. Now, someone who's fairly new would probably get this wrong, and someone who's fairly advanced would probably get this wrong. Let me give you a better hint. In this function, the type of T is deduced as S ref. All three of these class definitions oops, mean the exact same thing. This version, this version, and this version are all identical. The problem here is that we declare a local variable s1. When we pass it to the constructor, it is a reference to non-const because we didn't declare this const. The compiler generates this default copy constructor regardless of whether we say equals default. Templates don't prevent the instantiation of, uh, or the generation of copy constructors. But the function template is a better match because s ref matches exactly, s const ref does not. So this prints, hi there. The important thing is to remember that the Compiler-generated functions have exact signatures, and there are special rules around when they're generated and when they're not. But given that they are generated, they follow the same rules of function overload resolution as every other kind of function. So if you have this t ref ref parameter, 
that can pick up a lot of stuff. Maybe a lot more than you expect. Um, Yes, yes, the, the comment was, this is a good candidate for explicit. And yes, I would agree. This is, if you mark this explicit, this code actually would still compile, though. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it wouldn't be very confusing what it did, either. If you marked it explicit? Mm -hmm. um, the comment was that it, it wouldn't be very confusing what it did. I, I think it still would be confusing because someone who partially understands the rules and says, okay, this is a uh, compiler is going to generate the copy constructor and I'm making a copy. It's going to call the copy constructor. Not quite. It's making a copy using this function template. Point is that T ref ref can hide the copy constructor when T is deduced as a reference. This is known as reference collapsing. Essentially, when you have this double ampersand, in a deduced context, then the type t will be deduced as just t. So if you have an r value, it'll be just t. And if you have an l value, it'll be t ref. And t ref 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 is the same as just t ref. The l value and r value references combine into just an l value reference. Now, I mentioned when you have ref ref in a deduced context. And I've kind of been tiptoeing around that, but I feel that it is important to be able to understand exactly what it means when we say a deduced context. So auto ref ref is deduced. Template type name T. T ref ref, that's deduced. Not deduced. It's an R value reference only over here. It's not a universal reference or a forwarding <laughs> reference um, because the deduced context means you have auto or a template parameter possibly qualified with constant volatile. Other stuff that you do means that double ampersand is going to be an R value reference always. So C11 added standard arrays. And the advice was use standard array knows about its size, it doesn't implicitly decay to a pointer to the first argument, it's safer, it's just as efficient, it has member begin and end, it works with all these algorithms, it's nice, use it. So we have these two statements. Oh, that should be a four there, pretend like that's a four. Um, we have these two statements, conceptually they're the same. The first one just gives us better type safety. But in C you can do this and in C++ if you use a C array. So here, C code has more type deduction than C++. That doesn't seem right to me. And the solution is a function template, make array. And it looks something like this. So we have make array. This has uh, what's called a variadic template parameter pack. So the dot 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 just means some number of arguments and we're going to call that whole pack T's. And there are essentially no requirements on what those types are. They don't have to be the same type. They can be int, long, double. Doesn't matter. Whatever they are, we're going to take the size of the whole pack, and that's the size of our array, just like with a C array. And then we're going to forward all of the arguments in. So this is a, a basic version of make array. Um, Something like this has been proposed to the standard multiple times. So you'd use it like this. You'd say auto array equals make array, the type that you want and the arguments you want to give to it. So now we think, oh yeah, we're good. Everything's happy. But then we have multidimensional arrays. C syntax on top, C++ on the bottom. That's no good. So can we do a little bit better than this? Let's consider our ideal multidimensional make array. It would look something like this. We'd say make array, we'd give it the type, and we'd specify all but that one final dimension, and we'd use it like this. And uh, the type of cool would be an array that contains two arrays of three strings. So this is where we want to end up. How do we get there? 
first thing we're going to have to do is get a better way of naming this type. If you'll notice, when I named the type, it was an array that contains two arrays of three strings. We have to jump all around to find out what this type really means. We have to read it the wrong way. Whereas when we're reading the C array syntax, you just read it in order. So let's come up with a better way of naming this array type. We have two classes here, really one class template and one specialization. The top one says, okay, so we have some type T and one or more dimensions. And our type, and this is assuming we're specifying all the dimensions in here. This is just another way to name that multidimensional array type and something that's more convenient than specifying array and putting the, putting the numbers in backward order. We say the type is an array that contains whatever the, the type returned by this of the rest of the dimensions. So we strip off the first dimension and then recursively pass the rest of them down in. Our specialization is when we only have one dimension specified and the type is array t comma one dimension. So now we have a slightly better way of referring to multidimensional standard arrays and then making it even better to make sure we don't have type name and colon colon type everywhere we use an alias template, C++11 feature. It's also referred to as a template type def. Essentially, all this does is forward to that multidimensional array struct we just defined and make it to where we don't have to always spell out type name, colon, colon, type. It's just a simpler way to use it. So these three all mean exactly the same thing. They specify the exact same type. If you queried them with standard is same, which is a type trait meta function that tests are these two types identical, it would return true. These are all identical types. And conceptually, they're the same as this type. And if we had my preferred syntax, which is a, a paper that I am preparing to submit soon, it would look more like this to have built-in multidimensional support in standard array to sort of mirror the syntax of C arrays in a way that is much friendlier for variadic pack expansion. So now that we can name this type, let's see how we make the type. Looks something like this. Same sort of idea as before, except a little bit more logic for computing those dimensions. So this function makeArray assumes that we specified all but that very last dimension. So the rest of the dimensions are going to be all the ones we specified, and we just have to calculate what's that one missing dimension. So we have this final dimension variable template. Um, sorry, uh, final dimension, um, I guess, uh, variable. Um, meta function, and we pass in um, the size of all of the arguments and the rest of the sizes. This is what we need to be able to compute what that missing dimension is. Final dimension looks like this. We have a static assert in here because we don't want the user to specify, I want a two by three by something array, and here's seven arguments. There's no way to deduce what that final argument is. So we have a static assert in here saying whatever, um, however many arguments you pass has to be evenly divisible by the product of all of the dimensions you specified. And then that final dimension is the amount of arguments you passed divided by the product of all the dimensions. So that product, open bracket dims dot dot dot, is a C++14 feature known as a variable template. Looks like this. First line, first two lines rather, say that the identity of multiplication is one, and if we have at least one argument, the product is that argument times the product of the rest. All this is is a compile time multiplication of all of the arguments that we passed in. Now, fortunately, C17 simplifies things a little bit, and our final dimension struct would actually look like this. 
This is taking advantage of uh, what's called a fold expression. And here we can just say, instead of having to write this um, variadic product thing, we can just say dims times dot dot dot, and that multiplies them all together for us. It's a variadic uh, left fold. So now, here's our make array. We're all happy. We can do single argument arrays with it. We can do, or single dimension arrays with it. We can do multi-dimensional arrays with it. We're just as good as C. Uh, yeah, not exactly a high benchmark. <laughs> Fortunately, we can do better. See, our make array, uh, we had to specify what the type of all of the elements are. Maybe we don't have to. We can use something called standard common type. It's a meta function. It's a, a meta function is a function like thing, but it operates on types instead of values. You give it types and it returns a new type based on those types. It's type computation as opposed to just type deduction. And what standard common type does, its purpose in life is to give you a type that all of the arguments can be implicitly converted to. So, if we have common type underscore t of int and long, gives us a long. Common type of int constant int is int, and int volatile ref, int volatile ref is also int. The reason is the arguments are decayed. The return type of common type is always going to be a non-reference qualified, non-const qualified, non-volatile qualified type. But the arguments are only decayed, kind of. It does. Yes, decay is the same as. Yeah, when I, uh, I, uh, sorry, the, the question was, uh, does decay actually remove like the volatile qualifiers there? Um, if you, um, you can run this in Clang or GCC, so it's, it's possible that uh, there's a bug in their implementation there. But when you run this in Clang and GCC, you can say static assert common type T int volatile ref int volatile ref and assert that it's the same as int and it'll compile happily. Now, I say that the arguments are decayed, um, kind of, and I'll explain exactly what I mean by that kind of there. They actually are decayed. They do call standard decay on them, but not in the way that we might want. But I'll get to that in just a moment. So fortunately, it's fairly easy to turn our make array function into one that can deduce the type for us. Instead of having someone specify t, and we just put t here, we say the common type of all of the arguments that we call decay on, the common type of all of those is going to be the type of our array. Now, you don't always want to have this. The goal of type deduction, of good type deduction, is that you only want to deduce what you want to deduce, and you want to specify what you want to specify. You don't want to have to deduce more than is necessary. In some use cases, you want to say this has to be this type. And in some cases, you want to say the type is whatever the types are. So fortunately, you can overload function templates in this way. You can have these two functions. f of long will return ah! And f of, or sorry, f of long will return true and f of seven will return ah! And that's fine. So we can actually have both make array versions exist without having to change the name around. One where users specify the type and one where they don't. And it works just fine. Now, I said that common type decays its arguments, kind of. This is the implementation of common type or a possible implementation. It relies on the ternary conditional operator. Now, what the conditional operator does is it tries to convert the first argument 
to the type of the second argument. It tries to convert the second argument to the type of the first argument. And it picks the one that has the best conversion, essentially. So in the case of like int and long, it says, oh, I can convert int to long and long to int. But long is a better conversion target, so I'm going to convert them both to long. So it does this conversion, and then whatever the result of that is, it decays that and makes that the type. Now, the problem is that this definition of common type doesn't work for every type. There's not necessarily a conversion from t to u or u to t. The goal of common type, the reason for common type's existence, is to find a type that both can be implicitly converted to. That's not necessarily the same as either one of the arguments. So it's possible and it's legal to specialize common type on a user-defined type. Standard library does this with standard chrono. You can have the common type of standard chrono time, point, time points or durations, and it works the way you'd expect. But the problem with this definition here is that when I specialize common type, I'd say something like this. Struct common type, I have my type and my other type, and their common type is some more general type. My specialization of common type, you have to remember, templates do exact matches. They don't convert. So let's say we have this function here. And let's say t and u are my types. If I pass an r value to this function, it'll work as expected. Because t and u will be deduced as exactly my type. If I pass an l value, however, it won't do what I expect. The reason is, my specialization lists my types exactly. If I pass in an l value, the arguments passed to common type are going to be my type ref, my type, my other type ref. The exact nature of templates means this specialization won't be found, and instead we'll go to this, and it'll either do the wrong thing or it won't compile. Um, a better implementation of common type would be one that says, is t the same as standard decay t, and is u the same as standard decay u, and if it is, do this. Otherwise, it's common type with the arguments decayed. Currently, the way you have to work around this is you need to specialize common type for your type and your other type, L value reference to your type and your other type, L value reference to const, L value reference to volatile, L value reference to const volatile on both sides in every possible combination. I believe that adds up to 26 different specializations that you have to write if you want to make sure that your common type specialization is picked up. And that's why in our implementation of make array, we decay the arguments first. We want to make sure that we pick up user, user specializations so that their wishes are respected without requiring them to make 26 overloads or 26 specializations of standard common type. Um, yes? So here, can, if you decay it like, you know, before passing to decal val, instead of decaying outside of the decal type, will that fix it? Um, no. So the question was if you were to decay the type here and here instead of here, mm -hmm. would that fix it? And the answer is no. The reason is this, uh, the ternary conditional operator there is a built-in language feature. It doesn't know anything about common type. So if I decay in here and here instead of out here, I'm still going to use the ternary conditional semantics, which are try to convert them to each other rather than whatever the user specified in their specialization of standard common type. So you have to decay first, and if that decay is different, recursively call common type with a decayed argument, so then you're sure you pick up the user specializations. So as another real world example of type deduction in C14, I wrote a library called the bounded integer library. The goal of this library is to have static bounds checking on integers. So no extra size penalty. It actually 
correctly detects the, the right size of integer that your values will fit in. And it does it, it creates a dependent type system. It automatically creates new bounds based on the operations you do on the types. So if I have some integer a, the first line says it's an integer between 0 and 10. Second line, it's an integer between 5 and 7. The result of adding those two is an integer between 5 and 17. All of this is happening with type deduction. We don't specify the type of C. We just say it's the type of whatever A plus B is. If we try to assign an integer that's between 5 and 17 to an integer between 0 and 4, that's compile time error because that's not a valid, uh, there's no possible overlap there. Is yes? Thing one and thing two are cons context functions? Um, yeah, in this example, yeah, they oh. would be const expert because we're assigning it to a const expert variable. So this works even if it is not const expert? Yes. So this bounds checking here works if it's not const expert. This next one does not. This is a compiler error if you make everything const expert. The reason is that bounded integer has a few different policies to it. You can specify what happens on overflow. The default is no overhead compared to built-in integers. But it can still do a little bit of checking as long as you make everything const expert. It can check the range, the actual values, rather than just the range of the types. So if you make this const expert, that's compile error, because oh, assume d is 10. Um, 0 to 9, you try to assign 10, it's compile time error. If you didn't make them const expert, the compiler essentially isn't given enough information. It, isn't able to make this line an error, but this still is, because this is in the type system. So this library uses a lot of type deduction to, like, using the library effectively requires type deduction. The goal is you specify the types of your inputs only. Reading from a file, reading from a network, reading from user input, uh, something another function gives you, a third-party library that doesn't know about bounded integer. You specify exactly what the bounds are of those input parameters. And from that point on, your goal is to specify as few types as possible and use type deduction. Because then you know that the types are going to be exactly large enough to contain your values and no larger, unless that's faster on your system. So I mentioned there were different policies. You can say null policy, throw policy, clamp policy, modulo policy. So this top one up here is very similar to int 8t. This bottom one is very similar to uint 8t, except that you can combine them much better with other operations. Um, I gave a full presentation on this last year. If you're interested, you can watch that. Um, but one of the reasons I bring this up is to give you a real world example of specializing common type, other than the standard library chrono and time point. The common type of a bounded integer, we have to go back to what does common type mean? It's a type that can safely hold all values of either type, something that it can both be implicitly converted to. So if we have two types, one goes from 0 to 10, one goes from 5 to 15, the common type is a type that can hold a value from 0 to 15. Um, if we want to use it, we'll want to take advantage of type deduction here. We have some function that calculates something. So we read from a file and we assign that. That's our input variable. That's where we specify the type explicitly. This has to be something from 0 to 100. And if it's not, we throw an exception. That's what that line is saying. And then we do some math and we return it. So the ideal way here is you specify the result as auto. And if we want to make sure that the range of our calculation is correct. The correct way to do that is not to actually specify the type of the variable. It's to say auto and use a static assert. Because now, rather than having an implicit conversion, we say the type is what it is, and now let me make sure that what I got is what I expected. Rather than the type is this or something convertible to this. Um, one last thing, and then I'll open things up for questions. Um, one useful utility that I found when doing programs heavy in type deduction 
is the ability to print a type at compile time. The way you do that, simplest way, is you create this class template and you don't define it. You don't say, you don't put the curly braces in there, you just forward declare it. And then when you want to use it, you say decal type some expression. The compiler gives you an error message saying no definition found for print your type name here. Works on Visual Studio, GCC, Clang. Gives you a nice readable error message printing your type. Um, and that is all I have. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. So the, the question was, with auto as the return value of a function, you lose some documentation. Your users don't know exactly what type it is you're returning. Um, so I think that in some cases that is true, that specifying the return type can be helpful. Um, I am not necessarily saying that you should use auto everywhere, um, but if you have a system where you're doing a lot of type computation, which can be useful to have the compiler double check you and generate the most efficient code possible, then you have to use auto and the benefits outweigh the costs. Now, the uh, C++ 17 um, feature we're working on, Concepts Lite. Uh, we had the, uh, the keynote about it. One of the things that is part of the proposal that he did not mention in the keynote is sort of a halfway point in between just saying auto and specifying the type exactly. Um, for instance, if I want to say this function returns a vector. Right now we have to say standard vector and commit to a type or have that type be a template parameter. With the concepts light proposal, you can say the return type is standard vector open bracket auto or auto comma auto if you want to make the um, allocator parameter whatever type it is, otherwise you're actually saying it's the standard allocator. Um, so if we get that section of the proposal, and that's actually the part of concepts that I'm most excited about precisely for this reason, because you still have the auto deduction and your types still have to be an exact match. You won't accidentally do an implicit conversion like you might do if you specify the type. But you can still document these are the parts that I care about. It's returning a vector of something, or it's returning an integer that is always positive. So bounded integer one comma auto, one up to something. We don't care how much it goes as long as it's positive, we're fine. Um, once we get things like that, I think we can start using um, deduced return types even more often. But I think in a lot of cases it is useful. Like for instance, if you have a short function like a const expr function. It's in your header, it's two or three lines long, you know, maybe five lines, and then at the end you say return some, t like some constructor call. You're specifying the type right there. You're not adding any documentation to specify it again in the return type. The function body is really short, it's really easy to see what's going on. All you're doing is making sure you can type the same thing twice. It's not really giving you any benefit. Yes. If you have an auto return type though, you have to provide the, the source, right? I'm yes. So you get more documentation that way. Yes, yeah, so the, the question, the, the comment was that if you have an auto return type, you have to provide the source. And yes, you cannot use a function with an auto return type without seeing the body because you have to know what type it is. Uh, so the comment was that gives you more documentation. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, on the one hand, <coughs> you have the source right there. You can see exactly what it's doing, which you can do right now. But on the other hand, using auto means that you can't have um, separate the compilation of your interface from your implementation. If, again, I have some function that's, say, 20 or 30 lines long, and I have a few library dependencies that bring in their headers, and those headers bring in their headers, you could very easily be getting into, you know, 10, 15 seconds just to compile this one header. And if you didn't use auto, 
and you explicitly specify the return type, you could put the function body into the CPP file, compile it once, and reuse that object file. Whereas in the header, same problem you have with, with templates of increased compile times. Yes? Well, besides that point, the thing that bothers me is if you want to separate the contract from the implementation, uh, the, 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 the auto seems to unencapsulate everything. And, and frankly, it, it, it goes against everything I have ever believed in as far as, as, as saying, even, even if the compiler can see it, the human being needs to know what is intended, what the valid range of inputs are, and what this thing is supposed to do. And if you, just, if you do that, you're, 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 you're basically saying, look inside the implementation of this function to see what's intended, and, and that's... Um, I mean, there's no way to ever change the implementation because you have said this is the implementation for all time. And do, do you see my point? I mean, it's, you don't allow the opportunity to change the implementation without changing the contract and interface. Yeah, so the comment was that by deducing the return type, we have the implementation is now part of the interface rather than separate from the interface. The way that we're computing the type is coming to some specific type and now we're committed to that type. Uh, is, is that a valid? Uh, the type, no, actually, let me give you a specific example. Um, I, I write a function and let's say, let's say it's factorial. Now, the implementation of factorial, if I pass it a negative number, will do something. It, it doesn't matter what it does because it's not intended to matter because it's not part of the preconditions. But if you show somebody the implementation, they go, oh, look, factorial of minus 1 is 1. Great. They'll use that. OK. That's, that is not the intent. So when you deduce the return type and you use the implementation in the interface, you're not telling the person what are the preconditions. And therefore, it's, it's, it's unencapsulating. It doesn't allow you to change the implementation and preserve the contract. OK, so the, the comment was that by making the implementation visible, people will rely on implementation details because it invites them to look at how you wrote it and rely on things that you aren't intending to expose to them. Which is, which is that that's fair? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think there's a, a few parts, I guess, to how I would answer that. Um, the first, you mentioned a factorial function. And it'll do something if you put in a negative number. It might throw an exception. It might treat it as a positive number. It might return 1. Who knows what it does? But it, 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 it doesn't really matter too much what it does because you have this precondition that the input value is positive. So in general, my solution to that problem is to make your preconditions explicit using strong types. So for instance, using my integer library, I would specify the input to factorial has to be at least 1. Or if you want the factorial of 0 to be 1, then at least 0. So it would be impossible for anyone to rely on that because it's impossible for them to pass it in. Now, you cannot always do that, I understand. But where possible, I do think that that is a good idea to make implicit constructs explicit. Turn errors where the programmer didn't read the documentation and got wrong behavior into errors caught by the compiler where the type system catches things for you. Do, do you really believe that runtime values can be caught at compile time? I mean, that's generally not true. I believe, so the question was, do I really believe that runtime values can be caught at compile time? I believe that the correct time to validate your inputs is when you receive them as input. So rather than checking in the implementation of the function, the function um, signature should say, this value must be at least 0. When you construct the value, if it's a value less than 0, then you have a choice to make. Um, in my library, how I implemented it, is that you have an implicit conversion if the range is entirely in the range, and an explicit conversion otherwise. And then it's up to you and what policy you use of what happens when it's out of range. For instance, the throw policy throws an exception. That would be how I would handle that particular case. But more generally, um, the entire standard library, almost everything in the standard library is a function template or a class template. It's possible for me to go in and see 
okay, what happens if I say call pushback on an empty vector? That is something that we can't really catch at compile time. Um, that's a precondition that has to be implicit in general. So what happens if someone does that? We can go into the implementation and we can see exactly what the compiler does. It invokes undefined behavior, okay, now we can go into the compiler source code and see, okay, what is the compiler going to generate for my particular processor if I do this? And I see, oh, okay, it's safe, I can do it, or oh, it'll throw an exception. Now, when you have a situation like that, you have to be able to document it and say this is a precondition. And if you document it and say this is a precondition and someone says, well, I'm going to take advantage of my knowledge of that anyway, that's a problem. And I don't think that separating the implementation from the interface necessarily fixes that problem. For instance, fairly regularly, we have at a lot of, peop a lot of people that I've talked to have, have brought up things like, oh, well, you know, this is undocumented in the Windows interface, but we know that the, uh, you know, the, the maximum granularity of the clock is 16 milliseconds, so I'm going to call sleep for 15 milliseconds, and then they update the Windows API, and suddenly we have better granularity, and their code doesn't quite work as they expected. Like, people are always relying on things you shouldn't, and I think that the only solution to that, in general, has to be a social solution, as opposed to a technical solution. One more time, just to give you an example. Suppose the precondition is something like, this integer must be prime, mm -hmm. or the array coming in must be sorted, uh -huh. or things that are not as simple that might possibly be caught at compile time, because I know from experience dealing with the contracts and the proposals and the standard that you can't put in the interface anything more than the most simple statement, because as soon as you do that, the interface becomes untenable. This has been done by Chandler, and he backed out this annotation, whereas runtime assertions are a very valuable tool in the implementation, and you use an English contract to tell the human being who has knowledge of the history of the function what can and can't happen. So this is very real. This is not an academic exercise at all, and, and I would respectfully disagree that with the amount that you believe can be checked at compile time. There are certain things like predicates on values that just cannot either possibly or practically or reasonably be caught at compile time in the interface. Yeah, and so the comment was that there are some things you can catch at compile time and some things you can't. And essentially trying to catch everything at compile time is not going to work. And I, I agree with that statement completely. And I like assertions do like regular runtime assertions do have their place. I, I don't think we should like th or that we can get rid of those. I'm not trying to say that. And I believe you had your hand. Uh, a while ago, we were talking about um, using auto as a return type as under specifying what you're supposed to return. Um, isn't using a concept instead of auto? Uh, supposed to fix that, sort of? So the, the comment was, isn't using a concept instead of auto supposed to fix the problem of underspecified return types? Um, that, that is one of the goals, so that, for instance, you could say, I'm returning a container, let's say, instead of returning auto. Um, yes? Yes? Uh, yes, the comment was that you, I'm sorry, could you say that again? So his complaint was that I, I, I would change the contract if I change the implementation yeah, because I use auto, uh -huh. because the return type is reduced. Yeah, so what I, when I change the implementation, I also change the return type from auto to what was, has been previously declared, uh, implicitly now to declare explicitly, and I'm done. Okay, so the, the comment was that you can go from having auto everywhere to explicitly annotating in types where that proves necessary. Um, I, th I think John's point was more that by using automatic return type deduction, 
that's another thing that forces you to put the implementation next to the interface and people can look at that and rely on it. Yes, more so than true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can always cast it back to the old type. But that's not the uh -huh. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? Oh, yes. I've got a bit of concerns with this make array constructor. Yes. Um, because you put in a huge amount of values and then you, you have this multi-dimensional uh, analysis of, of the numbers you have. <coughs> um, but if you get something wrong, we were back in the days of Fortran where data statements um, usually uh, or could uh, easily mess up if, if, if you have some shift in it and you add another one and you have got the, the right number of elements but they are shifted in some way. So will there be um, a support for for this curly bracket sub syntax, and on the other end, with this curly bracket sub syntax, you you can um, just uh, define the part of the array you're interested in, and the rest get standard defined. Okay. So the the comment was that um, we have checking in our make array function for the overall bounds, but we don't have anything actually checking that each of those subarrays have the correct elements in them. So, for instance, the syntax for, um, let me pull it up here real quick. Here we go. So, the syntax for the C array has, optionally, braces around the subarrays. With C++14, those extra braces were made optional. Um, the question was, would it be possible instead to have a make array function where we can put those braces in there to require that all of our subarrays have the correct size and make it a lot easier to read um, that they do have the elements we expect? Um, and the answer to that, um, you know, at first I was going to say no. And the reason I was going to say no was because template parameters cannot deduce, well actually no, I am going to say no. Um, so I was originally going to say no because template parameters cannot deduce initializer lists. However, it is possible to default the argument of a template parameter to use an initializer list. However, arrays cannot be initialized with standard initializer list. Standard initializer list is not usable in a C array initializer and standard array is defined as an aggregate, which means it does not have any constructors. So it does not actually have a constructor from a standard initializer list, just a braced initializer list. Um, now, to change that, we'd have to change the rules for what makes something an aggregate in C++, which is not a paper that I am about to write. The, uh, there's, there's actually another problem with specifying things as uh, with braces like that. I ran into something similar to this a while ago. <coughs> and the, the relevant term is brace elision, where the compiler will just, yeah, I think I know what you meant. Uh, yeah, so his comment was that um, with brace elision, you can get uh, maybe unexpected behavior. For instance, if you didn't put that aid in there, um, let, let's say you specified all the arguments, but you, you left some stuff out. Um, what the compiler does is any remaining arguments are all going to be value initialized, um, which for built-in types means set them to zero. So you can uh, zero initialize an entire array by just putting empty braces. It, but that can also happen accidentally, whereas make array specifically asserts that the size is the exact size that you needed. Um, yeah, one more question, then I think uh, I think my time is up. I just had a slight concern about this, um, about make array here, is that I'm not sure you're going to be able to have, say, 256 template arguments. Um, so for the implementation that I showed, um, I wrote a C++11 version originally, before C++14 came out, that did a lot of this. The code was much longer, and most of it was dedicated to 
building up the correct number of braces for initialization. Um, I tested it with up to somewhere around 5,000 to 10,000 arguments um, in uh, up to four dimensions. And I found that GCC and Clang both took somewhere on the order of eight gigabytes of memory to compile that and 20 to 30 seconds to compile. Now with C++14, with relaxed rules for braces, we can get rid of all of that code to build up the correct number of braces for initializing all the subarrays. And now when you compile it, it takes a fraction of a second and no noticeable spike in memory, even at, you know, say a thousand. I, I don't remember the memory profiling when you get up above 5,000 or so. And um, the reason for that is all of these overloads are calling an aggregate constructor directly. They're not forwarding function parameters through more functions. As soon as you have a very large variadic pack and you have to forward it through multiple function calls, every function call you do uses up a huge amount of memory, whereas this only has one level of variadic pack expansion. That, that's where the, the memory usage came from in the, in the other compilers. Um, and I think with that, my time is up, so thank you all for coming. <laughs>